Welcome to the Ghostly Gallery podcast, a place where we explore the world of horror in film, television, literature, and popular culture. Well, greetings, everybody. My name is Bruce Markison, and as always, I'm joined by producer and co-host Tracy Asteria. Tracy, we welcome you to the show. How are you? I'm doing really great, Bruce. How's everything going with you? Pretty good. Uh, my wife Sue and I are just back from Serling Fest in nearby Binghamton. Uh, they had a big event this weekend where they unveiled. Actually, it was uh, earlier today, on the day that we're recording, they unveiled the new bronze statue. It's a six-foot statue of Rod Serling in his hometown of Binghamton, New York. It's in Recreation Park, and it's uh, really cool looking. And that really capped off a weekend full of presentations and panels, discussions. Uh, We're going to talk about that a little bit later after our guests today get into more depth, but it was fun to go to Serling Fest. And coming up this year on Christmas Day is actually the 100th anniversary of Rod Serling's birth. So it was a really special occasion this time around. Oh, that sounds exciting, Bruce. Yep. So we'll, we'll talk more about that in a moment. Uh, But our main attraction for this week's show is uh, a man who's returning for a third appearance with us. It's Edward G. Pettit, the Sunstein Senior Manager of Public Programs at the Rosenbach Museum and Library in Philadelphia. It's a terrific place. Ed does great work there. Ed is the man who has created the very popular online programs, Sundays with Dracula and Sundays with Frankenstein. Uh, Also did a program on Jane Eyre and most recently completed Mondays with Sherlock, an exploration of the many stories of the great detective. And Ed's going to be doing another one of these biblioventures, as he calls them. And that's what we're going to talk about today. This next biblioventure is coming up on September 23rd. That series will begin. The series is called Monsters and Ghosts. Edward's going to break down the Robert Louis Stevenson classic, The Strange Case of Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde. And then later, as we get a bit closer to winter, Ed's going to follow up with a series of programs on Charles Dickens' A Christmas Carol. So we're looking forward to that. We're going to talk about those two great literary works. Ed, welcome back to the show. How are you? I am great. Thank you so much for having me. Third time. Is that the record yet? Am Am I close? Am I tied with anybody? I'm very competitive by nature. I watch a lot of sports. Well, so. you're tied with another guy from Philadelphia, Josh Hitchens, each at full oh, appearance. Oh, Josh. There you go. I yeah. love Josh. So, yeah. Yeah. We had right, Josh, Josh, I think and- on, we had Josh on in the fall of last year, then in the winter, and then I want to say early spring, we're due to have him again, but right now you and him are at the top of the leaderboard. There we go. So yeah. I'll take that. You know, tied with Josh is great because he is he is a great horror creator himself, especially, you know, in the theater. Um, he had um, and he had actually showed interest in in being a co-host for Jekyll and Hyde. And I absolutely, you know, he's he's on my you know very short list that I could have brought in. But in the end, I wanted to go with some other co-host and keep it smaller than I've usually done. Yeah. Otherwise, Josh would have been back. And for those who don't know, he was a, he was a co-host on Sundays with Dracula, yep. um, uh, the first show that I did for the Rosenbeck. Yeah, he's kind of a, a renaissance guy. He does it all. He's uh, an actor. He does these one-man plays, which are just amazing. He writes all of them, then performs them. And he's a great historian, as you mentioned, of horror. I've yet to ask him about a horror film and said, have you ever seen this one, Josh? I've yet to have him say no. It's like he's seen everything (laughs) and he knows them all. Pretty amazing. And he knows the obscure ones too. So Josh is really great with that. Well, you, uh, of course, are very knowledgeable too, especially when it comes to horror literature. So we're going to talk about these two classic novellas, The Strange Case of Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde, and then uh, the very popular, uh, not only at Christmas time, but really it's it's popular in, in a lot of ways year round, and that's Dickens' A Christmas Carol. So, Ed, how did you decide on these two for this upcoming Biblio venture? Well, you know, it, to, to, for people, most people won't think of Christmas Carol as a horror story, and 
technically it's not, but it's very related with the ghosts. And, I, and, I, and, I'll, and, I'll, and I'll explain how that really fits in a bit. But, um, you know, in the beginning, when we started doing these programs for the Rosenbach, these free shows for people, you tune in every week. We gradually work our way through a book over, you know, many weeks. Um, I had uh, it was great that the first two we chose were Dracula and Frankenstein, as much as I love monster stories, I got to do those. And and the works that we choose to do for this, for the Biblio Ventures series, they also have to be in our collections. Mm. So we like, it's not just, I can pick any book. Like we, this has to be a key work in our collections both of those books we have. And, okay. and of course with Dracula, we have the wider collection with the, with the Bram Stoker's notes. Um, but uh, after those two, we were out of monster books. And I was like, oh, no. Like, I can't. And that, so, but we did Gothic adjacent. We did Jane Eyre. And then, and then I moved into Pride and Prejudice. I mean, I'm, I'm a 19th century guy is what I am. So I, got to, so I got to do Jane Eyre and then Sherlock Holmes, which was great. And last year, we acquired a copy of Strange Case of Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde. And as soon as we acquired it, a first edition, I was, well, there, but I'm not doing it. So, um, so I knew we were going to do that right away. Christmas Carol, we already have a first edition of, and, um, and it's great for it. And it's a first edition, first printing. It's the first, you know, uh, couple thousand books that were published and that sold out immediately in the first couple of weeks. And it's a, it's association copy. Dickens signed it to a close friend of his. So uh, that's a nice copy to have. And we have a, we have a great Dickens collection anyway. Mm. Um, so I was able to focus on two books and I thought I, with the Sherlock program, I just did Sherlock Mondays was 30 episodes. And then I did an eight episode subscription only series on hound of the baskervilles hmm. and then i just did two special summer episodes for sherlock mondays 40 episodes in a year is a lot of live program because i go live i'm not i don't get the luxury of post-production like you guys i'm live i have to do it all <laughs> live and everything has to work and there it is so, <laughs> so um that's 40, you know, 40 shows, 40 weeks in a year in a, is, is a rough going. So I wanted to make it a little easier <laughs> on me. So I, and these books are perfect because they're both, they're both kind of short. Yeah. Um, and a bunch of Jekyll and Hyde. So it's going to be six episodes on Jekyll and Hyde, five on the book, and then an extra episode called the legacy of, of Jekyll and Hyde. And then six episodes on Christmas Carol. And that works out because it's five, Jekyll, because Christmas Carol has five chapters or staves, as Dickens calls them, stave one, stave two. Mm -hmm. There's five staves and then, and then a legacy of Christmas Carol. So two six episodes. I'm even taking a week off in between and uh, it's a little more manageable. Um, but they, they will work. And, you know, as 19th century books, they, both do something really interesting with the supernatural or, I mean, with Jekyll and Hyde, you could say it's not really supernatural, but it is, it's, it's a natural thing that happens. It, it's something supra natural mm -hmm. is what happened because it's scientific and it's a potion. And, and let me say this right off the bat here too. There's no spoilers. I think for Jekyll and Hyde, um, we're actually, when we cover all the books we've done, we're very careful about if you're reading it for the first time, we don't want to have a spoiler in there. So we only talk about whatever chapters we're doing that week. But I've told everyone for Jekyll and Hyde, read the entire thing first. It's very short. Some editions are like 40 pages, you know? Yeah. So it's very short. And and then we'll, we'll talk about a, a couple chapters at a time, but you can't talk about what's going on without kind of saying how it's leading up to what happens later. So you kind of, I mean, Jekyll is Hyde, Hyde is Jekyll, right? Like, you know, if yeah. you don't know that it's really unusual, if you don't know that um, really unusual, not that some people don't, I taught this in college and I had a, I had, I had a couple students who were like, oh, what it's it. You didn't, like, how do you not know that? Like, cause, because the phrase Jekyll and Hyde is so ubiquitous in our culture. It's used all the time for someone that has an evil side and a good side. 
And now they, a couple, a couple students I had were just a little surprised. They just kind of, they didn't, they weren't quite keying in on what it meant, but even that, I, I just think that it's, it's unusual for people to not know that. So, um, so we're, I'm spoiler free or I'm, I'm, I'm all spoilers for Jekyll and Hyde. Well, kind of, yeah. I mean, I'm all spoilers in that, like that thing isn't a revelation anymore. Um, but that story is, even though it's, it's not, it's not a supernatural monster. It's still a monster story and it's still something beyond what we would consider natural that could happen in the natural world. Um, and a Christmas Carol is it's even subtitled a ghost story for Christmas. It's about ghosts and ghosts sure. come in. And visit him. Um, so, and, and they're both, so big in the 19th century, so influential um, towards our contemporary culture that I just thought, let's throw them in the mix and see how well they work together. Mm -hmm. um, I'm not sure one will really comment on the other so much, but um, but they both are about, uh, I mean, like, in, in a way, they're both about a kind of a, a person, a character who has to, re who something extraordinary happens to the character and they have to learn something from it in a sense, or they're affected by something. I mean, but, but that's, that's about as close as you can get for a plot sure. you know, to be close in that way. Um, and, uh, and I'm interested to see, and in in when, once we get the Christmas Carol, whether I can make some connections between them, um, you know, uh, uh, many years ago, I taught a course uh, called uh, pride and Prometheus. In which we did Pride and Prejudice, and then we did Frankenstein, mm. and people thought they had nothing to do with each other. Well, they were both written by woman authors within just a few years of each other, and um, I kind of think the, written by two people who were being influenced by the same culture, and this is how they came out. And they might we we did we were able to find some kind of thematic connections between the two novels which which was interesting and um uh, so maybe we'll be able to find that with these as well well that make that makes sense to uh, me well, you know we had an episode not that long ago where Tracy and I did reviews of the new movie Long Legs with Nicolas Cage and then a, a movie that came out 50 years ago Madhouse with Vincent Price and by the time I had seen both of them, I made the contention that Nicolas Cage is the new Vincent Price. So <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Which may or may not make sense, but it was a theory anyway. Edward, <laughs> let's begin with the 1886 novella, The Strange Case of Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde. First off, I just want to do kind of a technical point here, because I have heard it said that Robert Louis Stevenson actually intended for the pronunciation of the doctor's name to be Jekyll and not Jekyll. Can you clarify? It is. Is, is that it is. It's Jekyll. And I'll still say Jekyll because I grew up my whole life saying Jekyll. Um, but it is supposed to be Jekyll. And there's even he even uh, there's even a letter that Stevenson wrote to somebody where he says it's Jekyll. To, rem to remind, it's Jekyll and Hyde to remind with Seek and Hyde. Um, and there's even a pun in the, in, the, in the novella itself where Utterson says, oh, if, if he shall be Mr. Hyde, I'll be Mr. Seek. Um, and uh, it is, yeah, he, he likes that rhyme, but it's, that's just the way it's pronounced in Scotland. You, it's just Jekyll. Um, and it was Jekyll even in America on the stage for a long time. And in the first sound film of it, the Robert Mamoulian film with Frederick March in which you won an Oscar for it. At one, at one time it was the only horror movie to ever win a best actor Oscar until trivia question. Either of you know, who's the second actor to win a best actor Oscar for a horror film. Wow. Um, Thanks. Uh, Thanks. Hopkins? Mm. No. Anthony Hopkins won for Silence of the Lambs. Oh, he did. That's the okay. only the second actor to win a Best Actor Oscar for a horror film. Now, people could argue serial killers and horror. Yeah, it is. Um, <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> Silence of the Lambs is a horror film. Absolutely. Um, mm -hmm. 
But uh, in in the Mamoulian film with Frederick March, it, they pronounce it Jekyll all the way through. And there are some people that are, that contend, and they may be they may be right. It's in the Spencer Tracy uh, version of the film from the 1940s that becomes Jekyll, and then it's Jekyll. But I, I kind of think that Jekyll was the way to say it in America anyway. There's Jekyll Island in New York, and I think I think the I think the I think the name was always it's not that unusual a name actually, but I think the name was always pronounced Jekyll in America and. And then it just became that way. Well, nobody in Scotland says Jekyll. So it's always Jekyll and Hyde over there. So oh, um, really? Yeah. Okay. So I, I, it'll be it'll be something we talk about during the show. And I was wondering if I was going to take the hard line and just say Jekyll all the time. But I don't think I can. Like, I think that it's it's too hard for me to unlearn 50 some years of saying Jekyll. So. Okay. Yeah, I know. I've always known it's supposed to be pronounced Jekyll, but I've never said it. I always say it's like Jekyll and Hyde. It's yeah. just, it doesn't sound right. And I could never, like if I was in your spot, like doing Jekyll a Jekyll sounds weird. It does. And I could never say, especially with a straight face, right? Yeah. <laughs> so, um, And I'll be totally honest. I've actually never read the novella. I've never read it. And I know it's like, 40 50 or 60 pages um but i'm familiar with the story um and i probably have seen a movie are you familiar with it because because it is it is very different from the film versions and and it is one of those texts that the main storyline like frankenstein yeah Mm -hmm. scientist creates a being out of dead parts and then he terrorizes like that's still all the movies of frankenstein but once you read frankenstein Mm -hmm. This isn't any movie that I've seen. <laughs> um, and and it'll it it's it's true in a, it's definitely true with uh uh Jekyll and Hyde as well. That um it is all the movies add something, and it's, what they're really adding is sex and women um to okay. all the movies. There's no yeah, there's none of that happens in the book. Um in the book. Um, it is it is a it is a man's world. It is a novel of a bunch of guys who are all concerned with reputation, concealment. And there's like I mean, there's like a woman landlord, of, but like they have like one line or like the servants and you know, that's it. There's no actual there's no love interest in uh, in, in Stevenson's book. Stevenson wasn't good at writing women anyway, as, as is, and that's a well-known thing that he wasn't good at writing women. Oh my gosh. Oh, that's interesting. I'm going to read it before we chat again next time. Um, so I guess just going to that point where like, I'm, I guess, not familiar with the story. Um, why would this novella tend to get a little bit overlooked, um, in the general public? Like some people may not have taken the time to read this. Isn't that like always the case? I mean, until the last, you know, couple decades, nobody read Frankenstein. Um, and now Frankenstein, everybody reads because they have to read it for school. Um, mm-hmm. But before then, that wasn't the case. And uh, I, I, I still run into people all the time. They haven't read Dracula, but they've seen all kinds of movies. Um, it happens more with um, books that aren't considered like classic literature that you definitely would have encountered in school. Um but Jekyll and Hyde is a great one too because it's it really is it really is pretty short. I mean, you could read it in a sitting or maybe two sittings. It's not really that long to get through. And I also don't think Stevenson's Robert Louis Stevenson's prose is that difficult for the 19th century. Some 19th century writers can be difficult to get through. Uh, right. I think Stevenson's is pretty good. I don't know. That's one of the things I like to talk about on the show is how accessible this is. Mm-hmm. to people reading it now um i can say it's very accessible of course well i've read it like a hundred times and i've taught it and you know i know all this you know so um but i but i wonder for first time readers if it if it want what are the things on it that really um uh, might they have difficulty with okay but i don't think you will i think that like tonight we could finish this taping and then you could read Jekyll and Hyde and 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 realize that it's not a hard read and and you'll get through it pretty quickly. Oh well, I promise you I will read it for the next time we chat. <laughs> Thank you.
There you go. Another win for me. Goal in life. Somebody else read Jekyll and Hyde. It is interesting, Ed, that it is such a short book because there's a lot to the story here. This is something that Stevenson, I think he could have made it a lot longer, don't you? Yeah, but I, but then I think it would be it's 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 one of the I think it's one of those perfect stories. I think that it's it it's everything that's in it is all that needs to be in it. And um there's so much packed into this little bit that you don't need you don't need any filler to play it out. And if you had other things to play it out, other kind of plot lines, say there's a romantic interest or something like that. Well, maybe that makes for a, 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 an enjoyable story to read, but it doesn't really contribute to this core idea, this idea of um, it's I mean, it's basically a gentleman doctor who is trying to eradicate the evil impulses of all mankind. Like he has this purpose or does he or is he just trying to find a way that he can go off and be evil <laughs> And and that's his excuse for then like letting his you know inner hide out. Um, uh, it's it, there's just enough there that it really really works. Now, you know, if you're going to make a film of it or a series or anything like that, you have to add more. If only because those kind of story arcs need certain things to exist. And mm -hmm. if you just film this straight through. It's not going to have the kind of story beats that you need that appeal to a modern audience, um, which because you're adapting it for another form. Um, but even as a full novel, it's you don't you don't need any more for this. And it's you know, it's it's barely a novella. Um, and it, it just like a great short story works because it's an idea just for a short story. Uh, mm -hmm. Same thing out with Poe. Um, in, in, in all his, you know, great short stories when then Roger Corman had to make them in the films and Richard Matheson wrote all the great scripts for them. The, the post stories always have like a great, you know, two acts, but they need a third act to make a film. And so they have to add another storyline in there to, to flesh it out because that's the way a film would work. Um, and they don't, or, or they do. There's one, um, there's one, uh, portmanteau film of poe uh what's it called uh it's a tales of terror i think where they're able to do just the, the stories in short pieces so um but uh yeah i don't think you need any more for for jekyll and hyde there's we're gonna have easy two hours of talk for every like couple short chapters like 10 to 13 pages a week is all we're doing something like that and we'll easily have a couple hours to talk about. Oh, how long did it take the author to write that novella? Do you know? That's a, it's, and, and, and he wrote it quickly. Now there, there's these great, there's this been long standing story about how he had a dream and a nightmare and he was having mm -hmm. a lot of nightmares because he was taking erg, ergotine um, at the time, this kind of, hallucinogenic you know things to, to cure stevenson had all kinds of illnesses he may not have had tuberculosis but he certainly was throwing up blood he was supposedly spitting up blood all the time but he was sick his entire life he had chronic problems with 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 his lungs but also all kinds of other issues he was very sickly for his entire life and so he was always you know and and and, and taking drugs was his way of helping to cope with this and so he was having terrible nightmares because of this. And the story is, is he was having a nightmare one night and his wife, Fanny, woke him up. And he's like, oh, why'd you wake me up? I was having this great, I called it like a, a, this great bogey tale. He was having this great ghost tale he was having. And for him, it, and, and, and it was a scene of Jekyll taking the potion and transforming the hide. I think there might have been another scene that he had dreamt about. And but then he, he quickly wrote it down. And this is the story. And he wrote mm -hmm. it down, wrote the story, and he gave it to his wife. And then she looked at it and she was like, ah, you kind of missed the point here. And, and you know, this isn't quite right. And she left the room. She came back. And she, when she comes back, it's in the fire. And he says, oh, you're right. I burned it. I'm going to rewrite it. And then he rewrites it. Well, this has always been the story for Jekyll and Hyde, how he conceived it. And then he mm -hmm. wrote it very quickly, wrote it in like, you know, just like a, a few days or something. Well, 
those stories actually came from a biography that his stepson, that Stevenson's stepson had written decades after he had died or a decade or so after he died or maybe longer. And it doesn't seem to line up with the the few mentions in letters from the time that he that he told people, oh, I have this new story and, and I'm writing it now. Mm-hmm. Um, and the fact that they're actually draft, there's a couple drafts of it that exist. So that's probably not a true story. And that takes away from the romance of it, that he threw it in the fire. And this was what I always believed. He probably didn't. That was probably another story that his wife remembered that he threw into the fire and not this one, but he had, but he was inspired by dreams and he wrote about it afterwards Mm -hmm. and he did write it fairly quickly. I, I mean, it's, it's one of these great literary history stories about him. That's, probably not true that that he he was inspired by a dream and he's written about it and dreams are very important to stevenson Mm -hmm. and 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 his writings as well um but he he wrote it and worked on it but in a short time but it's a short book it's not like it's a really long novel so it's not like it shouldn't take you more than a month or more to write this out and then he did make revisions and um unlike most 19th century stories, most 19th century novels and publications are first drafts. Um, uh, and there's very little, very little editing in 19th century great works of literature. Um, and that doesn't, that doesn't happen until the end of the 19th century and certainly in the 20th. Now, if you write a novel, you send it to like, it's got like the agent's going to have comments and then your editor and your, but before they even get it, you've probably had three drafts of it. Nobody ever wrote that way in the history of humans until now, until the 20th century. Uh, well, it's the 21st now. Um, so, but he, he, de- he did make some uh, serious kind of revisions to that first draft before it's published. And some of it exists, not the entire manuscript exists, but mm-hmm. some of it exists in two different pieces. So as a matter of fact, the, the founder of the Rosenbach, where I do the bibliometrics for, uh, once had the the part of the manuscript for uh, Jekyll and Hyde, um, uh, and then and then it was later sold, which is a shame. So I uh-huh. wish it, I wish they hadn't sold that and would have kept it in our collection. But we do have some other great Stevenson. We have some other manuscripts of Stevenson that uh, didn't get sold. Um, did you Did you have a chance to see that, like, to read it? I don't know. No, I mean, this is long ago. Like this was in like the 1930s it sold. So, um, uh, but, uh, uh, and I don't know if it's available to view online. I think Yale might have a part of it. Um, or is it Harvard might have, I can't remember, but another institution has one of the manuscripts and I think someone else has another. So. Oh, interesting. Well, thank you. And I'd like to get your thoughts on what I think is an interesting way that Stevenson begins the book. When the story begins, Jekyll has already started to become Mr. Hyde. Stevenson chooses not to get into all the experiments and that transformation. What do you think of that? Um, it's, it's, it's a very unusual construction for a story. It's not chronological. You're right. It starts and there's a couple guys see this door. It starts the story of a door. That's the name of the first chapter. Um, doors and keys are, and key, literally a key for a lock, v- key images in this story. Um, if you're, if you're Tracy, as you read it for the first time, pay attention to doors and pay attention to keys in this book. Um, they really, I mean, it's because it's basically a story about what's behind the door and what are you hiding behind a door and who has the key and who can access this. And, um, uh, it's, it's Stevenson as a writer uses this very well, but it's a, it's a really strange construction. It's a couple guys on the street saying, Hey, I once saw this story where this, this like really horrible looking guy, hi, trampled this girl. And then. And then, and then the, and then the other guy knows what he's talking about and he's investigating Hyde to try to figure out who he is. Cause he knows he's the beneficiary of her will for Jekyll. And then, 
And then you get another document that is a letter from somebody else, uh, Hasty Lanyon, about Jekyll. And then you get a Jekyll, you know, confession at the end. It's really strangely constructed. Not that, not that, uh, not that different from, say, um, Dracula. And that we don't get letters in this. Well, we do get we get a letter and we get a confession, but but the but the third person narration, the beginning, is all point of view of of uh, of, of, of of a character of Utterson. and the um and it's just a weird way to put the story together. But it helps because what you get then is you get somebody Utterson who doesn't know what's going on. And then he's gradually comes across things that reveal what's going on. And then you get the full confession from Jekyll at the end, which then explains everything else. This is why this is why it's hard to talk about it as a serial book, because what happens is there's a lot of mentions in the first few chapters that are really interesting if you know the end. So you can't like just pass it up and say like, hold on to that. We'll wait till five weeks from now when we mention what that means, because you can't go back that way. You know what I mean? You've got to say like, you see, and this is about what's going on. So, um, but that first audience, that first audience that read this book had no, had no idea that Hyde was Jekyll, that they, Mm. that, you know, and it is, it is constructed in a way too that gives a great reveal for what happens, and then everything becomes um, everything doesn't become clear. Everything becomes more kind of obfuscated. More kind of you like you have to figure out like wait a minute, what are Jekyll's motives then this whole time? What has he been doing and? And it makes makes the morality of the book a lot muddier, actually, when you when you come across that final revelation. Um, I've encountered people who talk about um, the book and they're like, oh, it's, you know, Jekyll and Hyde and it's his two sides as if they're two different people. Right. Um, And then what you realize at the end, what Jekyll doesn't even realize entirely is that. No, Hyde's you. Um you're you you know that's that's all you you've been doing this and you're not coming to grips with it and uh and stevenson understood that um some of the people that talked about it at the time didn't uh there there were sermons there were there were there was there were preachers at the time who loved the story they were like oh this is a story that shows how you try to be good and you have to conquer this evil side of you and stevenson was like that's ridiculous that's not that's not when i was that's the, no, it's about it's about all these hypocrites that go out and pretend they're good, but they're really monsters. Um, and uh, it's about taking that mask away. It's about opening the door, coming out of the closet. Um, there's a great kind of, you know, um, a, a really interesting, you know, kind of uh, homosexual reading you can give to this book. Um, and that not just people in not just like modern, you know, Literary critics have keyed in on this. People in Stevenson's own time were thinking that that might have been what he was hinting at, that that, that may have been what Jekyll was trying to hide something, he was trying to keep his secret in his closet. So, hmm. interesting. Um, it's, you know, it's it's endlessly fascinating and for such a short book. So I want to pick up on something you just mentioned that I was not aware of. People at the time reading this in the 1880s didn't know that Jekyll and Hyde were the same person. So the mystery to this novel or this novella is something that was certainly prevalent for readers back then. It's not really a mystery to us, but it was to them. It it was. It's actually, you know, for this, it's written as a mystery story. Now we're not, we're not, we're not in the age of the uh, eight, you know, in, in, when it's published, we're not quite in the age of the mystery detective story, although there are some things that are kind of leaning towards that. I mean, Poe invents the mystery detective story in the 1840s, but or, um, but it's not quite there yet. Um, but it does, it is kind of constructed like then what later definitely becomes the mystery story in which there's a crime or there's some kind of mystery to solve. And then somebody is going out to solve it and f- come finding evidence and then you get a confession, literally a confession 
at the end that explains it all. Um, but that mystery part of it is, is uh, very much there. When it's first published, um, it's in England, when America, and at the Rosenbeck, we have a first American edition, which is actually the true first edition because it was published several days before the British edition. Um, and, um, but when it comes out in England, uh, it costs one shilling and it's got paper covers. So it doesn't come out as like a hardbound book. It's just a paper covered book. And, um, uh, and it's a, a thriller story and they call these shilling shockers. Um, and that's the kind of book it was. So it was certainly not considered like any kind, anything approaching legitimate high literature. It was a shilling shocker. Um, and people, but critics at the time really understood that, that, that Stevenson was making some kind of serious contribution to, you know, great books and that he was writing about something more than just a thrilling tale uh, and wrote about it as such. Um, and Stevenson had this interesting reputation because I mean, he had written up to this time, he had written a lot for, he had written magazine stories and thrilling, you know, and, and horror stories, the body snatcher and, and things like that. But this was, but he was most known for Treasure Island, which was technically a children's book, and even him and his conception of it. But it's it's it, it's a children's book, and like The Hobbit is a children's book. Like any adult can read Treasure Island and get so much out of it, even and then and now that it's and it's and it's and it's very and it's a story about a boy who really. Uh, learns and and becomes an adult and 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 has these relationships that really teach him things about life, um, but but they're mature things that he learns and um, it takes a real and, and and adults get more out of it in a sense than kids, um, and this is the kind of reputation he has coming into this. He has he has just written a novel for adults that's just for adults called Prince Otto that is a kind of failure and it's poorly reviewed and nobody likes it. And, um, and it's not that good. Um, and Jekyll and Hyde comes out and it's, it's kind of the stamp on this is going to be a significant book, even though it's a shilling shocker. Um, and, uh, that doesn't happen that often. Like when Bram Stoker writes Dracula, people liked it and reviewed it well and it sold okay i mean it it stayed in print but nobody was like this is a great book but there were people that were saying jekyll and hyde was a great book when it came out uh, and there were people that were scared of it too there were people saying oh this is this is a little too much this is a little too kind of dangerous in a sense um uh you shouldn't have you shouldn't write books like this that don't have a clear moral where the good people win in the end um it's uh it's a it's a muddy I won't talk about the very ending of it, but it's it's you know, it's a it's an ending that is um troubling in a sense. So I'm not sure how much resolution happens. Oh interesting. So it was really quite popular when it was initially released. Mm-hmm. Yeah, very popular. Like uh I mean it it's it sold greatly in England and um, and in America as well, uh, the quarter million copies sold in America in the first, you know, and at least in those, like the end of the 19th century, 200, 250,000 copies at least sold. And, um, uh, it, it sold exceptionally well in England, well reviewed and, and he could finally, um, I think Stevenson was finally making money by that point too. doing this writers never make, I mean, very few writers make money. Um, like the biggest of the big make money and everybody else has another job, um, or, or somebody to support them. Um, you could, you could like, we could name best selling authors who, of course, you know, Stephen King and Lee Child, and all these people who like make a lot of money and they're never, but there are also people on the New York Times bestseller lists who have other jobs. <laughs> it's was, the passion that was true then that's true now it's always been true um but 
Jekyll and Hyde, he was starting to, the income was starting to coming in, was starting to really come in from you know, that um, Treasure Island was popular enough. And then Jekyll and Hyde and then Kidnap Follies. I think, I think Kidnap is just after, that's Kidnap's not before, is it? And, and Kidnap was, was very popular too. And he was starting to make enough money to kind of really be okay. I mean, Stevenson was okay anyway, because his, because his father, his, his parents had, had money and were always able to support him. And if they had not been able to support him, he'd have been dead. He would mm. have died. Like he might not have made it to 20 because he was that sickly. Wow. Um, but he was able to survive. Ed, one final question on this novella or related to the novella. Uh, you'd mentioned earlier the film from 1931 uh, called Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde. Great performance, uh, Oscar winning performance by Frederick March. Is that the best of all the adaptations or is there another one that you prefer? Well, for me, it is. Now there's, there's, there's three great Jekyll and Hyde movies that come out and that's the Mamoulian in 31. And then the Spencer Tracy one, is it 41? I can't remember the yes. exact year for this. 1941. Yep. And then the silent one before both of them with John Barrymore is really, really well done. Um, and then, well, I mean, Adam Costello, I mean, Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde, I mean, Boris Karloff playing, you know, Jekyll and Hyde. You can't, I mean, that's not, I love it's that. not a bad movie, but it's, yeah. Um, so you can't, you can never knock that. I'm never going to knock an Adam Costello movie, um, especially when they meet monsters. Um, but, um, and then there are some later TV adaptations that are good, but, you know, for me, it always it's the 31 Mamoulian with Frederick March that is just it understands what this story is about. And there's so many touches from that story that are in that film that aren't in other films. Although it is it is great to watch Spencer Tracy do a virtually um, makeupless performance as Hyde in mm -hmm. which he's just trying to change his expression and. I mean, Barrymore tries to do that a sense, although he does have a, like a prosthetic on his head to change his head shape. But um, they um, those are interesting to do. But um, Mamoyan gets it. There's just there's just so much in it and the whole and the way he becomes more monstrous as it goes along. And it's very related to this anxiety that I think is behind Stevenson's book, this anxiety of of devolution, this anxiety that 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 the Hyde is this kind of atavistic, you know, primitive past coming up and, and making its presence known that everybody in the, in the late 19th century was afraid of, you know, post Charles Darwin. They were all, they were all afraid that like, we're all going to turn into like what we were in the past because, you know, evolution and we could go the other way. You can't go the other way. That's not the way it works people. Um, but um and and Mamoulian gets that as well in that film. Um, uh, it's uh, I can't remember the writer of it, um, but it's uh, that's the one that 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 I like the best. And we'll really try to do the the films when we get to the final episode of this because we'll do five episodes on the book and I've broken up the right. chapters and you can find them all how they're broken up on the on the registration page for this um, our web page. But um, the final episode, The Legacy, um, my co-host for that episode, for the final episode, is going to be Leslie Klinger, who has just done an annotated edition of Jekyll and Hyde, came out last year. Um, uh, he's also famed for doing annotations of Dracula, Frankenstein, Sherlock Holmes, uh, Sandman, uh, Lovecraft, um, and he's got a Jekyll and Hyde. And he'll come on that last episode and we'll really focus on films then when i when i when i talk to um leslie Klinger, but at, as long as i'm on i also want to mention that i have two other co-hosts who are doing uh jekyll and hyde with me and that's olivia retigliano um who has done a couple sherlock episodes with me and she is a she's an editor at crime reads uh for 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 lit hub online and she's brilliant 19th century you know uh, scholar herself and really knows this kind of work well and then uh, Paul Chapman is my other co-host for um, Jekyll and Hyde. And he is, um, uh, I had him do Hound of the Baskervilles with me, but he also does, he's also, he's done a lot of Dracula work and Sherlock Holmes work in his life, but he's also a big um, 
uh, a proponent of uh, ghost stories and MR James and was one of the hosts of a great MR James conference that happened several years ago. So my co-host for the for the Jekyll and Hyde series will be really uh, really know this book well and 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 uh, I'm, for for those who haven't watched these shows, it's it's me talking, smoking, and drinking, and there's cocktails. There'll be a cocktail for every. <laughs> episode a new especially a new special cocktail for every episode um uh and uh and it's the two of us talking about you know these chapters for a couple hours um uh and um and i and you need good co-hosts to be able to pull that off very good we're looking forward to the breakdown of dr jekyll and mr hyde the strange case of beginning on September 23rd. Edward, let's move on to the second classic story that you're going to be profiling as part of Monsters and Ghosts. It is Charles Dickens' A Christmas Carol. It was first published December of 1843. It sold out by Christmas Eve just a few days later. So people really loved this one right from the start, didn't they? Absolutely. And um, it is, and it's, and it, in a way, it's his comeback in that, Dickens has had this enormous success early in his career and it's become, you know, the, 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 the best known writer in England at the time and, uh, and, and makes the most money. And then he has, a, and, he, and, he, and he takes a little break and he goes to America and has a little trip and then he comes back and then he starts another book. And first of all, the Americans are angry with him because then he writes about America in not so flattering terms. And then the next book he writes is Martin Chuzzlewit. And it's not that like people don't love it as much as his other books. And he's on a little bit of a downturn. And then he writes Christmas Carol and it's like, everybody loves it. And there's stage productions immediately. And, um, and it goes on to, you know, continue to, 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 to do well for him. Um, but he's also writing a ghost story for Christmas you know, the subtitle of it and a ghost story of Christmas is the subtitle. And the Brits love ghost stories at Christmas, you know, in America, especially growing up, you think like, Oh, Christmas and, you know, sugar plum fairies and Santa Claus. And that's what it's about. But the Brits are like, no, 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 no. you tell horror stories on Christmas Eve. And, um, uh, and there's a great tradition of that there that, Christmas Carol is tied up in it existed before then, but I think Christmas Carol solidifies the fact that ghost stories belong in Christmas. And, um, uh, and this is the, the way he wants to tell a story that he thinks has great kind of, um, kind of social ramifications. Cause he's telling a story about how the downtrodden in our society need to be taken care of and and it's all it's everyone's you know job to do that you don't rely on government for that you don't rely you know you you have to you have to take care we all have to take care of each other and christmas is a great time to learn that and to get that message across he decides i'm going to tell a story about a man who is haunted by his past and haunted by his future and that's a really interesting twist for a ghost story that you're not only going to be haunted by your past, but you're going to be haunted by your future too. Um, and there's, a, there's humor in it and there's a kind of a lot of heartfelt drama, but Christmas Carol can also be scary. Um, and I know this because my children refuse to let me read it to them. Um, like from the little that they knew of it, they like, as soon as Marley comes in, they're like, no, 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 no. <laughs> like they want no parts of it whatsoever. And they wouldn't let me read a Christmas carol to them. And that crushed me. I was like, what? I've read the Hobbit to you. What do you mean you won't let me read the Christmas carol to you? Um, now they, they thought that was too scary. Um, and I guess it was, <laughs> yeah. I mean, I'm not believe them that it was, and there are scenes in it that are that are scary, but it's also, I think, as you know, uh, me coming to the book too, that that the themes uh, in it are are it can be difficult, you know, 
um, when, you know, when, when the ghost of Christmas present, for those who haven't read it yet, when you do read it, when the ghost of Christmas, Christmas present reveals ignorance and want, it is, it's creepy. And, um, uh, it really has an effect on you. And then of course the ghost of Christmas future, like, you know, like death coming and in his robes, it's, you know, so I, I, I it, there's enough scary elements in it that, make it qualify for this but but the the most interesting about it thing about it for me as a ghost story lover um is 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 this way that that dickens writes ghosts for it and does this you know supernatural turn that i mean you can't argue with it that it is still it is the it is the most popular thing that he's ever written it is in the top five most popular things ever written in the 19th century. Um, uh, maybe it's even number one. It's that and Pride and Prejudice and Frankenstein and maybe Jekyll and Hyde for its kind of cultural resonance. Um, you know, I have a Google alert for Jekyll and Hyde and every day things come up and half the things have nothing to do with the story. They're about... Like, and this criminal is a general Jekyll and Hyde character. Yeah. You'd be surprised how many sports stories come up about Jekyll and Hyde. I'm like, yep. what? The team is not a Jekyll and Hyde. Um, <laughs> but that term itself, because it's so, you know, used so much that it's that it has that much resonance still. The idea of it has that much resonance. Um, Christmas Carol is up there with them as well, that everybody knows Scrooge. Yeah. Um, he's the one character in Dickens that everybody knows what a Scrooge is a miser and a really mean guy, but no, he's actually a really good guy because he get, he reforms yeah. but that we'll talk about at the end. So nobody Ed, talks about Scrooge as a good guy, yeah, but yeah. he really was. And in addition to the telling of horror stories and ghost stories at Christmas time, what were some of the other British customs at the time in the 1840s when this came out? You know, Dickens gets that uh, invented Christmas kind of moniker on him. And it's not true, but he is enormously important in in the idea that Christmas is a domestic, secular holiday. Now, Dickens wouldn't have said it's a secular holiday. It's, of course, about the birth of Jesus, and this is the whole idea. But, well, you didn't write a book about that. That became the most popular. <laughs> Copy the book you ever wrote. You wrote a book about how it's all about family and how we all take care of each other and think of each other and centered around the hearth and home. That's what you really wrote about. And um, uh, and that's kind of what becomes then one of the most important things about Christmas, that Christmas isn't just a holiday for people who want to celebrate the birth of Christ. People, Christmas is a holiday for how we all get together and uh, be close to each other and love one another and take care of one another. And Christmas Carol has a big influence on that. Um, the The ways people celebrated Christmas were um, some people didn't celebrate Christmas, um, you know, and especially if you're in, you know. Uh, you know, we're talking, you know, we're talking the 19th century where there were no laws about how much you could make somebody work. And if you have some kind of job, you might be working on Christmas anyway, because you had to work six days a week anyway. Right. Um, you're lucky to just have Sunday off. Um, and uh, so it wasn't that kind of day where everything stops and everything is focused around it. But at the time... Ah, oh, this, I mean, this starts early 19th century, but it's, it's really generating a lot in the 1830s and 1840s. And that is the commercial, um, you know, kind of mercantile world around Christmas. Um, people talk now about Christmas creep, like, oh, it's September and they're already putting Christmas stuff out. Let me tell you, I can, I, I there is evidence. I have come across 19th century articles about people complaining about people about stores putting out these end of the year christmas and new year's books in september like really? come on like wow. why don't you wait for that absolutely in the 1840s <laughs> people were saying this 
Um, it's never, it's always been the case because the commercial appeal of being able to sell something around an idea is very important to, you know, you know, you know, markets to, to markets. And, and that's Christmas's, it's really tied to the market. Um, uh, Halloween is tied to the market. Now Halloween didn't used to be tied to the market. Um, now it's very tied to the market. Um, you know, the spirit stores were up in August, um, for Halloween. Um, and I'm fine with that. Um, I, Halloween and Christmas, I, I'm never a person that says, uh, it's too early. It's never too early. I will celebrate Halloween and Christmas all year long. They're my two favorite holidays. I can't get enough of them. Um, I'll sing Christmas carols in, you know, in March. I'm totally fine with that. I will, you know, celebrate Halloween at any time of the year before Halloween. I'm totally fine with it. Um, so I don't have any issues with it, but that's also tied in with it. And, and, and so it's the ways people celebrate Christmas. I think, I think we, we do it. I, I, I think we're, I think we also have to acknowledge the realities of it and how it operates in our lives. And, and that it did operate in people's lives in Dickens' time, and it was really, really starting to become this as a time where it's not just a religious holiday, it's some kind of celebration that we're all aware of and we buy things for. Um, but Dickens's contributions to it are are kind of beyond that and more important than that, which is really nice about it. Um uh, but people didn't have the same kind of traditions we have now. I mean, the whole Santa Claus, St. Nick, whatever visiting you is, is sporadic in Europe and America. And sometimes it's kind of creepy and not great. And sometimes it's nice. And that's something that slowly builds through the 19th century into the 20th. Um, I don't think, I mean, Dickens and his kids and other people's kids certainly weren't waiting for Santa Claus to visit them. Um, that that's later for them, mm -hmm. but in America, some people are thinking that, um, and, uh, Christmas trees are kind of become very popular in England, at least in the English speaking world, because of the German traditions that Prince Albert brings in, in, in his marriage to Queen Victoria. And there's a famous picture of them in a magazine with a Christmas tree said like King and Queen, King and Queen have a Christmas tree. We want a Christmas tree. So that happens then, um, it's not everybody's not rushing off the church on Christmas morning um, in, in even in a, in a heavily Christian society in in Europe and America. Then that's kind of that kind of comes actually a little later. Yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, so it's it's a mixed bag. Um, but gifts gifts are becoming important. And for Dickens's time, I guess maybe the key difference is Christmas isn't considered a day as much as Christmas is a season. Christmas is Christmas Day through New Year's. You were you were just as likely to get a New Year's gift as you were to get a Christmas gift. Um, and maybe you would only get one. Maybe you would get both. But it's that there's a week there that it's really 12 days um, that you would that you would be celebrating the end of the year. I see. Um, I see. And the beginning of a new one. And Christmas gets tied in. Christmas is more tied in with New Year's then than I think it is now. A Christmas Carol and also the strange case of Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde will be profiled as part of Monsters and Ghosts. It'll begin online on Monday, September 23rd. Ed, how can people register for these programs? You can go to the Rosenbach uh, website, rosenbach.org, or search online, rosenbach.org, Monsters and Ghosts. I'm sure we'll have a link in the, in, uh, for, on the, on the web page for the podcast. Um, and register for it. And when you register, I send you uh, 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 an email every week with links and a little information about what's coming up the next week, the cocktail recipe that we have coming up for the next week. So you can also, you know, make that cocktail yourself and drink along with me because I just want to smoke and drink and talk about books. You'll have the pipe with you, right? Always. <laughs> Ed, as always, uh, it's been a lot of fun. Our guest, Edward G. Pettit, the Sunstein Senior Manager of Public Programs at the Rosenbach Museum and Library, 
previewing his next Biblio venture starting September 23rd. Great stuff as always, Ed. Thank you. Appreciate it much. Thank you for having me on again. Number three. Now I got to go for four and I'm going to tell Josh I'm going to be four one day. Yeah. Once we get up to six or seven, we'll create an album and start selling it. <laughs> there we go. Thanks, guys. Thank you very Love much. Ed. We're going to take a short break, folks. Uh, Tracy and I will come back and I'll talk briefly about what happened at Serling Fest in Binghamton over the weekend. Stay with us on the Ghostly Gallery. Welcome back to the Ghostly Gallery podcast. Bruce Markison, along with Tracy Asteria. Thanks again. Go out to Edward G. Pettit of the Rosenbach Museum and Library. Tracy, for just a couple of minutes here, we're going to talk about weekend activities. Uh, did you do anything exciting or interesting over the weekend? I did yard work. It was such a beautiful weekend, and I kind of got all my free winter stuff done. Lawn mowed weeding, all kinds of great stuff. So not as exciting as your weekend, though. Well, probably yours was more productive in some ways, maybe <laughs> not as much fun, but I did have a chance. My wife and I, uh, Sue and I, went to Serling Fest, an annual event that takes place in Binghamton, New York. It's about an hour and a half from where I am in Cooperstown. Well, more like an hour and 15 minutes. And this year was especially important because it's the 100th anniversary coming up of Rod Serling's birth. And also they unveiled a new statue over the weekend in Binghamton. And some of the highlights for me, I had a chance to catch up with two people that have been guests on our show. Uh, Mark Olshaker, uh, who is part of that uh, wonderful Netflix series, Mind Hunters. He's one of the producers and writers for that. Uh, he was also someone who was very good friends with Rod Serling. When Mark was all of 14, Rod befriended him and, and kept up the correspondence. Uh, Mark has great admiration uh, for Rod Serling and talks about his legacy. And he and one of Rod's daughters, Anne, participated in a panel with Mark Dewidziak. And he's another one of our past guests. Mark was with us one of our early shows to talk about his book on Edgar Allan Poe. So I caught up with mm -hmm. both Mark Olshaker and Mark Dewidziak. Uh, Mark Olshaker was kind enough to uh, introduce me to Anne Serling to meet her face to face, which was great. Uh, Mark Dewidziak uh, told me that his Edgar Allan Poe book uh, did very well. It sold more copies than any of his other books, and he's done over 20 uh, during his prolific career. But they both participated in the panel, offered some personal stories and remembrances of Serling, a man that they not only admire for his writing and his creativity, but uh, a man of, of great character. Uh, he was somebody who fought against uh, racism and bigotry. Uh, he was somebody that uh, really took a kind approach to others. He was the opposite of the stereotypical Hollywood person. He wasn't into the flash and the glitz. Every summer, he would go to a summer home in Cayuga Lake, not far from here, and he would spend summers with his family in that beautiful setting. So he liked to get away from Hollywood, and, and he was a big family man. So it was great to hear from those guys. Also heard from two guys that I had never met before, but they are co-authors of a book on Rod Serling's Night Gallery. That's his later TV show that tends to get overshadowed by the Twilight Zone. So Jim and Scott have written this comprehensive book on the Night Gallery. It's, it's got beautiful color paintings that were used at the beginning of the show during the introductions. You know, it's an expensive book, Tracy. It's $95, but <laughs> it's beautiful. It's, it's a wonderful layout, and it's got everything you'd want to know about the Night Gallery show including the behind-the-scenes problems between Rod Serling and the show's producer, Jack Laird. They had very different philosophies. They often disagreed. Laird kind of took over a lot of the creative control of the show as the show went along. Uh, these guys also told a great story, um, unfortunate story, about how uh, an NBC executive really kind of torpedoed the Night Gallery show. 
Uh, there was a, a high-ranking NBC executive. He did not like the show. His name was Larry White, vice president of programming. And for the show's third season, he cut it to a half an hour, often preempted the show seemingly for trivial reasons, also moved the show to late Sunday nights where he knew it was going to draw a bad rating. And all of that set the stage for Night Gallery being canceled after the third season. And one of the guys, Scott Skelton, really made an interesting point. You know, it, it kind of upsets him whenever people say, well, you know, Rod Serling, he really peaked with the Twilight Zone. And after that, he didn't do much. And Scott uh, Skelton said, that is absolute nonsense. Uh, Serling, even after Twilight Zone, continued to put out some great scripts, some great writing. Some of his Night Gallery episodes, the, the ones that were the best, were some of the best work that he ever did. And he really didn't remain a creative force uh, until his passing in 1975. So I thought that was a really uh, interesting thing uh, to hear about. Uh, there's lots of other great stuff. And I think during future episodes, I'll sprinkle in some uh, anecdotes and some information. Uh, just a, a great weekend. And it all culminated today in the unveiling of the Rod Serling statue in Recreation Park. And that Recreation Park, that's uh, the park that essentially was the influence uh, for the episode Walking Distance. Uh, that was the, uh, the influence for the setting of that, uh, of that episode and, and what took place there. So it was, a, it was a wonderful weekend in the small city of Binghamton, New York, celebrating the legacy of Rod Serling. Pretty cool stuff. Oh my gosh. Oh, that sounds wonderful. Um, I was, when you told me about your little adventure, I looked on the website and kind of saw a few of the activities that they were doing. Did you get a chance to go on the guided tour of the museum? Were you able to, to go to that? I did not. Uh, there, yeah, there is a museum in town that has a Serling mm -hmm. uh, exhibit. Um, I have seen it in the past. Okay. It's been a few years. We only went mm -hmm. Saturday, so we didn't do the activities Friday. We didn't actually go to the statue unveiling earlier today, so we missed out on those. Um, but mm -hmm. I would like to get back there at, at some point. My understanding is that in the future, they would like to have a museum built from scratch, brand new, mm -hmm. totally dedicated to Rod Serling. Uh, that is one of the goals that they have. The statue is, in some ways, I guess, the first piece to that puzzle. And it took a while mm -hmm. to get the statue. So finally, that's done. And I think that museum is probably the next project or at least one of the next goals that they have. Oh, that would be amazing. Oh, it sounds so fabulous, Bruce. You guys have so many cool events down in the States. I think it's phenomenal to be a fan. <laughs> you know, you're always welcome here. Um you have a passport, right? You can come down here. I do. <laughs> I'm going to have to like start doing some of that stuff. I mean, you have so many different conventions and fan festivals and and now this one, we don't have really anything like that here. So I'm envious. I'm going to have to become an American. <laughs> well, you don't have to go that far, but uh, we'll, we'll work on getting you down here at uh, at some point. Well, Tracy, thanks for uh, being with us, as always, on this uh, episode of The Gallery. Appreciate it. Oh, thank you. It was so much fun, as usual. Our thanks to Tracy, our guest, Edward Pettit of The Rosenback. Our thanks to all of you, our listeners. We want to thank you for joining us in this Museum of the Macabre. And we hope to see you again next time, right here in The Ghostly Gallery.